Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 19. So if you've peeked ahead in the GitHub and looked at which lectures are which, I've actually swapped them around. So this was historical lecture 20. I am deciding to reorder them in order to uh, best make use of the remaining time this quarter. So what we're we talking about today, we're we'll talking more about open source project development, which of course is what you're all doing right now with your uh, course projects. So last night you all had your deadline for that first uh, working demo. And so with that working demo, you've done a great thing. You've gotten, you know, uh, initial proof of concept working. You have some code, you share it with staff. I'm looking over the next few days. And so today's talk to me a bit about more about how just these projects work in the wild and might introduce you some tools, some techniques you might find helpful for um, improving your project. And so that's what we're doing today. Uh, and that's why I kind of chose the lecture. It's like, oh, wait, if you just are now changing gears from getting the first version working to actually improving it and making it more regular project, well, perhaps it's a better time to talk about project stuff in large scale. So yes, of course, please stop me at any point for questions as always, but especially today where I'm talking about a lot of experiences or things the way they're done, but it varies tremendously by the project. So please uh, speak up about those sorts of things. Okay, so to start off, you kind of imagine what the ideal you know, code or project is. Well, if you think about what are the most important traits, right? Uh, number one, it's correct, right? You want to work with code that <laughs> does the right thing and the right thing, not just some of the time, but every time, right? And perhaps there's something you're asking this program to do that's not reasonable, like you're giving it bad input. Rather than the thing giving you bad output, you'd rather this code tell you right away, hey, these are infeasible inputs, let you know right away, clearly, this is the problem, etc. cetera, right? Um, for example, you may have noticed recently both Clang and GCC have put a lot of effort into improving the quality of their compiler error messages. And that was kind of a result from uh, user feedback, right? It was, okay, well, you're a great compiler, but if I have a syntax there, it's hard to understand where the mistake is. And now, of course, the new versions of both compilers, it even shows you the little carrot where it thinks the error is, right? Kind of is much more suggestive. And so tell people when they have wrong input, for example, you have incorrect with plus code, and then let them know clearly where it's, the mistake is. But it's not just about being correct, it's also about convincing the users correct, right? Do you have enough tests to convince them this is actually a reasonable project and convince them it's tested? Okay, so correct number one in my book. Number two, uh, how easy to work with or understand, right? Uh, this can be helped with documentation. This can also be helped with just the overall software architecture, software engineering that was used in this project. How easy to kind of run around. And then finally, number three is efficiency. Even though I'm personally really like efficiency a lot, when it comes to code bases I want to use from other people, it's number three on my list, right? And it's because if these first two things aren't handled, who cares about number three, right? Um, and so, as has been the theme for this entire quarter, uh, it is hard to get all three of these things on the first time you write a program, right? It is really hard to do that, right? It's hard to just solve a problem for the first time, have it be correct under all cases, be really clean, clear, easy to understand code, and also be really fast. Uh, you're probably to give up on all three of these categories, right? So thus, we talk about this all quarter, right? Close the loop, iteratively improve. And so, yeah, of course, you're going to need to revise and iteratively improve. And so today's lecture is gonna be just about that, right? Given you have an initial thing that works and you want to improve it on these three functions, right? You wanna improve its correctness, you wanna improve its ease of working with, and you also wanna improve its efficiency. That's what we're gonna talk about today is how to go about uh, improving in all three of these different metrics. Okay, so uh, more concretely, what tools are we talking about for today? Uh, a few of you may have already seen in other contexts, but it's good to kind of reappreciate them. Uh, number one, continuous integration, how to kind of keep running tests, how to do some code management, documentation, and of course, uh, open sourcing in general. Kind of give a brief primer on that. Uh, okay, so CI or continuous integration. Uh, this is very much in the theme of make the tools do the work, right? You've gone through the effort to make tests. We've talked about this a lot in this course. Okay, you make various types of tests, you even do formal verification. You have all these tests, right? And so why not use those tests, right? Not get the most utility you can out of those tests. So that's what CI is about. CI is about putting computers to work to run your tests. And so the, int the intuition is that, well, even though you have a lot of tests, perhaps when you're doing your day-to-day -day development, you're running a subset of tests on the portion you think you're changing, but who knows that maybe you make some subtle change that break something farther away from what you thought you were changing and it causes a larger, deeper problem, right? And so uh, one solution is to have these tests run automatically by the tools, right? So rather than, you know, 
you've been required to run every test in order to do every commit. Instead, you run the test you think makes sense, but then the tools in the background are going to run more tests, perhaps all the tests, perhaps a larger number of tests, whether it be daily or some other frequency, and kind of alert you, oh, wait, you know, this thing you just did an hour ago actually is causing problems. And so, once again, we're kind of offloading this extra, you know, experience of doing this, right? You may think, okay, running tests is very boring for me as a human. Great. Automate that. Make the tools do it. Make the computers do it, right? And so, um, CI is one of those places where it really, really helps, right? And so, having CI is about saving yourself time. It's also making this whole thing more efficient. For example, if you have someone send you code from outside and you want to contribute it back to your project, you may not be sure that what it sent you makes any sense, right? And so thus, um, what makes the most sense, of course, is well to test the code they just sent you. And you can imagine it's kind of an annoying process. Okay, someone sent me a pull request, I have to run a test on it, and then look at the test results. Gee, wouldn't it be great if that could be automated? With CI, you can, right? With CI, you can have, oh yeah, you know, any pull request is opened up, run our test suite on it, we can see how it's looking, and you can see right away do these contributions make sense or not? You know, whether it be internal or external. Also, of course, um, even if no one even sends you any pull requests, just as someone else on the outside can see you have CI running and it's passing and it's been, you know, constantly being used, that increases their confidence your code's correct. So that's going to be a good thing. Um, or you can imagine maybe you depend on someone else for a project. They want to make a change and they really care about you as a user and they actually want to make sure their change doesn't break things for you. And so once again, having CI available is some kind of these tests, right? So having your tests and packaging them up in a way in CI where they're easy for computers to run automatically can make a lot of things a lot easier. And so if even for here in your course project, I recommend having CI, right? You're going to have some sort of test suite. Heck, why not have your test suite attached in a GitHub action so that way uh, it can run if you folks do uh, commits in your own project. So how do you go about doing this? Well, in order to do CI, you kind of need three things, right? You need the actual test, which we talked about you should have anyways. So you want to have lots of tests. You need some sort of way to automate this interaction. And you need some sort of way to actually execute this automation, right? So we talked about this first, right? Test, yes, you should have tests. Um, you may be wondering, well, you know, my test checks some stuff, but perhaps there's some things my tests don't check and something buggy can buy my tests. If you have that apprehension, um, that's not paranoia. That just means your tests aren't testing enough, right? So make sure <laughs> uh, you uh, have more coverage in your test. Make sure you, you know, have more tests and maybe use randomized, exhaustive, or you need to do to get increased coverage, right? Um, when it comes time to actually automating this, there's so many tools out there for this. So uh, if you want to do something simple, like you know, either a bash script or a makefile, that's fine. There's a lot of really handy tools, a lot of them are built into sites like GitHub, and so you can just grab onto some of those. Uh, and to be honest, after writing the test, this automation is the most of the effort, um, but sometimes it's not so bad. Um, and then finally, is the ex ex execution environment, which, once again, who's going to run your test? Now, for example, in this course, you guys can get by just fine with something like GitHub Actions, which is free. And so, yeah, you can just you know host a repo on GitHub and run Actions for free, use their servers, put them to work. That sounds great. But you can imagine maybe in a larger company, maybe you have to run it yourself, whatever you want to keep things private, or you have very, very big compute demands, you don't want to place it on the uh, provider. OK, so um, when you're doing your tests, you may hear folks talk about different types of testing. Uh, so for example, you may hear for expressions like unit tests, right? Of course, unit tests refers to tests to test a specific module or functionality or component in isolation. And these are really good for debugging. You can imagine you know, your entire thing doesn't work and you don't know where to look. Well, you can run a unit test and see which modules are behaving to expectations versus not, and you can, of course, spend your time on the ones that aren't currently behaving as expected. So that's really, really helpful. And so that's definitely the thing you want to think about. The other kind of testing is probably the one you think about a lot, which is also what we call integration testing, which is not just unit tests, but it's actually the entire thing, right? You know, does my entire circuit produce the answer it should? And so I think most people to think about testing, to think about these first two, to think about unit tests, integration tests, they're both really important. The rest are ones you may not have thought of it's worth talking about. So, uh, for example, regression tests. And so uh, this refers to tests to make sure that something that did work previously doesn't stop working, right? <laughs> uh, and so, for example, maybe, you know, this is when you run your code with an older version of the compiler, an older version of the tools to make sure it doesn't break anything, or make sure the older dependence version, which you still support, 
don't get broken. It's important to do this. There's nothing more frustrating than being a user of a package and have them change something and then it breaks for you. And it's like, this is a regression. I wish they had been checking for this. And this is a great thing to kind of do for CI. Because you can imagine with regression tests, there's so many different possible combinations. Um, it's a lot of work to uh, try them all manually, automate that, have tools do that automatically. And yeah, most of the time there's not going to be regression, but that one time there's a regression, having that being found in an automated fashion by CI will make your life a lot better. Now, another kind of test you may hear about is something called a smoke test. The point of a smoke test uh, is to, as the name implies, to kind of see if there's anything that's clearly wrong, right? So perhaps your entire test suite might take hours or days to run. That maybe is too long to do for everything. But a quick smoke test is a way to kind of say, you know what? Is this the least past the major things in a very cursory manner? If something fails the smoke test, you should be worried. But if it passes the smoke test, it doesn't mean it's fine. It just means it's good enough for now. But that's still helpful to kind of, you know, get things quickly, get answer quickly, no. Rather than waiting four hours, you can maybe know in five minutes, okay, this is the least great to compile. Another test, which maybe isn't as common for this project course, but another place you may hear about is performance tests, where not only is my code correct, but did I have a regression in performance? You know, I have a certain large tool base and it has a running, and how long does it take? Maybe it's faster or slower. I should be aware of that. And so, you know, all this put together to keep saying over and over again, make tools do the work, right? Make computers do the work. And if you can offload the computers as you make your life as a human easier, do it, right? And so, um, as you can see here, right? Running CI on servers is better than humans debugging stuff, right? Um, one advantage of CI is you can run tests that are more extensive than you do normally, right? If you're developing locally, you probably don't have a very long patience for how long you want tests to run. But if it's running in the background on a server while you're doing other things, perhaps you can run you know, your hours long test rather than your five minute test. And yeah, of course, also you can change your CI to run different tests in different contexts. Whew, okay, that was a lightning tour of CI. Any questions? So I think I'm gonna skip to the last slide because I have some links from the very own Chisel 3 project, right? So um, here, of course, of course, we uh, depend on Chisel 3. It's a actively developed open source project. Uh, these days, contributors come from a number of organizations, um, not just sci fi. And so they do quite a bit. And so uh, if you go into the Chisel 3 GitHub page, if you haven't done it already, you scroll down. Um, let's see, they removed it. No, it's still there. You can see, so for example, they have continuous integration. It says it's passing. Perhaps it's a good sign. Uh, what does passing mean? Well, let's have a link. Let's find out. Uh, is that text? There is a link. Okay, great. Um, why is this not? There we go. Just a link. Okay, not as helpful. But uh, fortunately, I know how to get to the dashboard, which is the next link. Uh, okay, so go ahead and look at the dashboard. So you can see, this is for the continuous integration for the Chisel project, what's happening. And so currently, it's running a number of situations. Uh, some situations is running for things like when people send uh, pull requests. And so for now, this project is being well maintained, where folks just can't can't just push any commits they want to the main branch. They have to instead, you know, open pull requests. It has to be reviewed by other people and that sort of stuff. But you can see in terms of the, the continuous integration, uh, these are various things that are running. You can see that. Usually they pass, green checks are good. Uh, these ones are still running as we speak, right? Um, sometimes things didn't work, right? Uh, so there's a quick one that didn't work, what happened? Uh, you can see where I was checking something, oh, what? One test did not pass down here. And so what was that? Uh, and yeah, you can see there's probably some sort of um, issue, right? And so yeah, so in this case, they accidentally broke the documentation. So this is a great thing for CI, where someone was writing code, changing the main functionality of the project, and inadvertently in the background, they broke the ability for the documentation to work, right? So that's the kind of thing you perhaps you wouldn't check if you were developing, but a great thing um, to have CI catch for you, right? Uh, so cool, that's that. And so your question is, well, how does it take to set that up? Well, if we go through my links I saved in this uh, page, we can see, by using GitHub Actions, or we have to set this one YAML file. And this one's pretty complicated because it's a big project with a lot of different combinations. Um, but you get a feel for it, right? You can test things like, okay, um, you know, when's this running? What branches am I checking? 
okay, what system are we running CI on? You can say, okay, they're running it on a pretty recent Ubuntu with the JVM version 8. Everyone's kind of very apprehensive about new JVMs. Uh, you can see, for example, they're doing two different versions of Scala, 2.12 line and 2.13 line. Uh, there's some additional dependencies here. For example, Espresso is used for logic optimization. Uh, I think we mentioned this briefly before. There's an up and coming um, back end they're going to be using under the hood for Chisel. Uh, and so the IR power set's called Circuit, and the actual way that's wrapped up is called Virtual. And so you can see that's a version they're depending on for there. In terms of the steps, you can see, oh, yeah, this is the various ones. They can check out the code, they can install the various tools they want to do to check things. In this case, for example, depending on the Tabby open source CAD suite to get some of these pre compiled binaries. Um, you got a sense of what's going on in the YAML file, right? They're kind of mostly setting up an environment, getting all the stuff set up, and then they actually run stuff, right? And so you see there's, okay, there's integration tests, there's documentation tests, there's your standard tests, there's even tests for the website. Um, yeah, so it's good to have a lot of different tests, right? Um, I suspect for this course, if you set up CI, it would be like a 15 line file rather than a multi hundred line file, but you get the idea. So cool. Any questions on CI? But yeah, I think it's a good thing to do both as producers and consumers of open source code. If you see someone has a project, you're going to use it. Check for tests. And a great way to advertise tests is to have a CI thing on your GitHub. Um, cool. Next, of course, is code management, all this code to hang on to. Now, um, many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with Git. We've been using this for our homeworks in this course. Uh, but I did want to spend a couple minutes to kind of point out some features that Git may not be as familiar with, or um, how some ways you can maybe perhaps use it more productively for hardware design, right? So one thing that folks maybe don't always know about is something called Git submodules, where it's possible in your Git repository, rather than just copying code from the repository, you actually can instead include a reference to another repository, right? So a submodule is a reference to another Git repo. And um, what's nice about it is it tags which commit it is. Okay, so I know it's going to be on this commit. And so that way, someone else can just clone your repo, and they can then close some modules. And so um, that's a very helpful thing. For example, maybe you have a dependence you want to get an exact version for. Some modules are a great way to kind of track that. Um, what's interesting, there's actually some debate in different schools of thought about how to handle this. Sometimes you have a very large project, and thus you have a lot, a lot of related projects. So all those related projects could be their own Git repositories. And at some point, you've got to have them be some modules be integrated. That's one school of thought. Another school of thought is what they call the mono repo, which is to have one giant repo, which actually includes multiple projects internally, and you just clone it and get all of them, right? And so it kind of merits to both, right? Um, and this is why people kind of look at the scenario and see which one makes the most sense. Having many projects that are truly independent, they should probably be separate repos. But if they start interacting with projects, they start being interrelated, in some ways it's better to have this mono repo because that way, rather than having, you know, a commit in some module A, a commit in some module B, and then you know, commits in the main module, referring to all three of those things, instead it's just one commit, right? And so depending on use case, it kind of ma matches that. And you may see when you come to repos, you may come across the project which has many repos and submodules, or you come across a project which has just one massive repo, and it seems like how does this all fit in there? This is fine. You may have, you know, you've heard, you know, by rumor or perhaps by experience, Google, for example, for many years is famous for having a massive repository for all of the code of Google, right? Which wasn't Git, but it was just a massive repository. There's some advantages to having your thinking in one place rather than carve up too much. So there's kind of two different ways to think about it. You can think about what makes the most sense for your project. Even if you have a mono repo, there's still some times when you should have some modules. For example, if you're depending on external dependence, uh, sometimes it's best to um, track it that way. Another thing that comes up a lot is when folks have branches in their Git, right? And so uh, Git makes it extremely easy to have branches. Uh, and I think all of us have the experience of a, some project just constantly creating branches and all of a sudden realizing that too many branches becomes a headache pretty fast, right? And so what do we recommend? I recommend having only a few long-lived Git branches. Having a branch be short-lived is great. You have a branch where you try out some idea and then there's even some resolution. Okay, this idea worked, I merged it back in, the branch is now merged, so I can delete it. Or perhaps it didn't work, and I don't want to save the code, so I can just get rid of it. Or maybe I will save the code, and I'll have this dead branch floating around that points the code I'm not going to use again. But 
you don't want to have a lot of long lived branches. Otherwise, it's kind of a lot where kind of constantly coping code between different branches. So for the project for this course, you probably need like one or two branches, right? One branch, of course, to be the majority of the work. Maybe you have a couple of branches to try out certain things, and eventually merge them in. You shouldn't end up with too many branches. Another thing, of course, is pull requests. You know, it's a classic way in Git to transfer code from one project to another, right? We can say, hey, I have, you know, this commit. Rather than just committing to a branch, you can instead point to a, you know, commit and say, hey, I want to you to pull in the gap between these two commits, right? And so what's interesting about pull requests, I think folks don't always think about, is sometimes it's a good way to do things even when the pull requests come from an internal source, meaning it's from you or your collaborator. It's still a nice way to kind of group together multiple commits that are perhaps conceptually related. It's also a great way to kind of do review. And you can say, you know what, rather than having just one commit kind of like chucked on there, I can say, you know what, I want to look at these commits together and kind of give you a review of them as a whole. Okay. So uh, I just kind of mentioned this notion of a code review in passing. It's worth me going into more detail about that. So what I'd like to kind of encourage students to think about this moment is when you think about the code you've written, whether it be for this class or other classes, uh, you can think of a lot of it as really just kind of like a rough draft, right? Where once the code seemed to work, you probably had other things to do and you probably moved on to your next task, right? So you probably didn't spend a lot of time cleaning it up afterwards, right? Or if you did clean it up, how much did you clean it up, right? And when you tried to clean it up, how did you even know what to improve, right? What were you going after? Right, and so the reason I ask you to reflect on that is to compare that to the alternatives of when you're writing uh, like text, like an essay or something. You know, perhaps sometimes you've done an all-nighter for last minute for an essay for a course, and maybe it wasn't very good. But perhaps there are sometimes you really spent some effort on something and hopefully it came out pretty good. Maybe something like, at, at a minimum, your personal statement from me going to grad school, right? So maybe you tried really hard on this and got a lot of feedback. The rough draft is only the beginning, right? You got a rough draft written one night. That's probably not what you submitted, right? You probably took that, you revised it a bit, maybe got read better people, got some feedback, and revised it some more. And so kind of the point to recognize is even if the content is there in quotes, um, you can still really improve what's there, right? You can still say, you know what, this is the text, but I can make this a lot more clear. I can make this more apparent, make this more explicit, make this easier to read. And perhaps one of the best ways to do this isn't just yourself reviewing it, but it's to get other people to look at it because they have different perspectives and kind of tell you what's missing. And so that's kind of the whole point of a code review is to help recognize, you know what, that just because the code works the first time doesn't necessarily mean it's done, that perhaps there's a way to, not just a way to, but it's worthwhile to actually review this code, revise this code, improve this code, and doing this discussion for another person makes it a lot smoother and better. So uh, there's different types of code reviews in different organizations, uh, but this can be a really helpful experience. If you've never been through one, I would really recommend trying to get your classmate to give you one for this project. And even if you're unsure whether to do it, I think that's still helpful, right? Um, I remember some code reviews I had in some of my first internships in the industry where I code I thought was pretty good and they gave me tons of feedback and none of it changed the functionality of the code. But as a result of their suggestions, I would argue that yeah, the code did get better and I learned also how to program better, right? And so that's kind of the whole point of this is try to make it more clear, make it smoother, and so there's some things, even if somebody is your peer, not because they're, you know, a super wise mentor, even if it's just they're your peer, there will be things they can spot that'll help you make it better. And so it can be really helpful. And, you know, you may have heard this before that code is, you know, read far more times than it's written. You know, you run write this only once or twice, and you know, it's be read by many, 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 many people, including yourself later on, right? And so Readability is really important. That was one of our themes for this course, you know, consider readability. We've all quarter, we've kind of talked about, you know, amongst different ways of playing certain generators, how do we choose ways that are maybe more readable? This is one of those places where it's manifest, where you can try your own opinion for what's more readable, but perhaps through a code review, your reviewer might suggest other ways to make it more readable. And, you know, perhaps that's the best person to tell you. It's not you, the person who wrote it, but someone else is reading it for the first time. What do they see? And what do they think makes sense or doesn't make sense? So what are kind of the benefits of code reviewing? Well, usually when you have a code reviewing process in place in an organization, the reviewed code tends to be much better, uh, or if nothing else, at least consistent. Uh, one way you kind of can tell if you're like a really good program, in my opinion, is uh, you don't want to be reading a repository and come across code and be like, oh my gosh, this code has certain traits. I know who wrote this, right? Instead, you want to have a shared repository where 
looking at a line of code, you don't know who wrote it, right? It could be person A, it could be person B, it could be person C. You know, my style is to have no style, right? In other words, to embrace whatever your group's styles are, or whatever your group's mentality is, and just make that very clear and consistent. That way, it's really easy to read across. But rather, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, person A does it this way, person B does it this way. I have to kind of think about changing. No, no. As long as it's consistent, it makes it read more readable for everybody. Additionally, of course, preparing for code review. Uh, if you know you're going to have a code review, you're probably going to try a little harder on your code to make it more clear so you can make it a little better. So that, that pressure of you know, being evaluated by your peers sometimes is a good way to kind of make you improve your code. And then also process the code review, not just you being there and receiving it, but also you helping someone else uh, helps make you a better developer, right? You're going to learn more about this. And so I really recommend this if you haven't had this experience already. It can be really, really helpful. Um, for example, if we, uh, first we'll go through the process first before I go to the end. So you might say, well, what happens in the code review? Well, it depends on the organization and the process, but usually the person who's creating the code is going to request a review, right? They, they've written code before it's fully accepted and merged into the project. You need to have it be reviewed, right? And so uh, even sometimes on GitHub, you can even it's explicitly where, you know what, there's no pushes to the master branch. You have to be reviewed before it can be merged, right? It has to have an explicit review. Okay, so then somehow a review is assigned to people. You find people that can review the code. Uh, the reviewer looks at the code, perhaps on their own, in their own time, asynchronously. Uh, they can also use things like continuous integration to see, oh, wait, this code you asked me to review, it does pass the test. That's a good sign. Perhaps you also have tools to check for style compliance. Okay, it passes style compliance, also a good sign. But it's don't look over them as, self, as humans to kind of see what's going on. And there's a lot of built-in tools. GitHub has these, for example. You can annotate the code. You know what? This line, I would change this. Or maybe this line is confusing or what's going on here. You can annotate various points of the code for discussion. And then the original code submitter can go ahead and look at those points of discussion and you know, either respond to them in the comments. They can change the code and push new commits. Perhaps you go through this process multiple times. So you can see this can be done largely asynchronously. And at some point, hopefully, you succeed. And the reviewer agrees, you know what? You've uh, adequately resolved their concerns. And they will accept your you know, market as approved and the code gets merged in, right? Now, perhaps in some organizations, rather than just being all asynchronous, there might be you know, some synchronous meetings to discuss things. Or perhaps you might even request a synchronous meeting if you're unclear about the feedback you're getting. But you can see how, in general, this process is, OK, you make the code as good as you can. They're going to give you questions and suggestions. You're going to act on those. You're going to revive and you're going to improve it, right? Like I said, so the whole point is you're reviewing and you're improving. Cool. So uh, let's say you're actually doing a code review. What should you be looking for? Well, number one, you should be checking for correctness. So even though you have tests, uh, you know, there's no guarantee in your right test that everything is covered, right? It kind of requires some human awareness of what the code's doing, the tests are testing to kind of be aware. Are we actually even testing for this functionality? What are we actually getting coverage on? Uh, you know, are there other things that we don't have coverage on we should be aware of? That sort of stuff. Humans have plenty of opinions about style and readability, so it's great to get their feedback on that. Uh, for example, there's even a tool like Scala Style. There's similar tools for languages, you know, that can actually run this thing and automatically checks compliance of various uh, style, style, style issues. So this is, you know, sometimes referred to as a linter, this kind of tool. Um, reviewer can also check for completeness, right? Perhaps this repository has a policy of, you know, yes, we take code, yes, we need tests, but in order to merge something, we need to have code, tests, and documentation. So if there's not enough tests, not enough documentation, they're going to tell you down the review, you know what, this is great code, but until you fix these remaining issues that are important for us, we're not going to accept it. Or perhaps there's other issues that matter, right? Maybe it's something you got to do about some feature, some visible issue, some sort of update, et cetera. There's a lot of different things that come up. Cool. So for code reviews, I'm going to go ahead and sneak back to the end. And we can go ahead and look at some stuff from that same uh, Chisel 3 repository. So for example, if we pull up a pull request, uh, you can see here's a pull request that was merged in the last few weeks, right? So what happened? Uh, we had a committer say this is a bug fix, and they kind of explain what it was. We can see the commit. OK. The commit actually touched a fair number of files. You can see there's a particular you know, annotation that was you know, getting dropped and to kind of fix a lot of places to make sure it wasn't lost. Also, they actually added uh, tests to make sure this uh, came up. 
okay. So this wasn't just a smokable fix. They actually had some tests for it too. You can see they requested a review from someone else. Um, this other person then uh, approved the changes. There's not seem to be any, were there any requests? No, there was no, uh, there were no requests for this review. They approved it. And yeah, it went ahead and by being approved, was merged in. In this case, it's actually a automated service we're using that you do the merging, but you can still see this process where, you know, submitted, uh, there was some code, a review, and then uh, the, the process here. Cool. Any questions about code reviews? Like I said, if you're, if you're in a pair project, I would definitely do a code review at some point if your colleague. I know you're going to probably can show this code anyways very casually, but it might be good to actually try and do it formally one time. So you know what? I want you to give me, you know, formal feedback in this one file. Perhaps you can consider some of these processes I described here and see what you see and be nice to see what you learn. If you're working individually, maybe you can still request someone else working individually also give your code. I think it's a really good experience if you have that chance to do a code review. Okay. Well, if we keep going. Uh, documentation. Something else we talked about is kind of an important thing to uh, bring up in this course, right? Or with your, with your projects, right? So what's interesting about documentation is that you kind of think it was, oh yeah, it's something that's kind of neat in the background and you got to you know, read the manual sometimes. But actually it does different things and you can have documentation that does some of these things well and that's actually perhaps efficient. You don't say that's when it hits home run all these to be helpfully super useful, right? So um, one of the most important things documentation needs to do, which I think a lot of projects actually fail at, is number one, summarizes what the project does. <laughs> so if you're just like browsing around on GitHub and you come across a project and you know, uh, let's say repo is called foobar and the first sign of readme is, this is the repo for the foobar project. You can download a code for the foobar project. And you're sitting here going, what the heck does the foobar project do, right? Like, <laughs> and so number one, make sure you summarize what the heck you do. Um, that's an important thing to do, number one. Naturally, uh, after someone understands at a high level what your thing does, perhaps you might care, care how to use it, right? You know, here are the instructions, how to use it. Okay, clone this, change this directory, run make, et cetera, right? That's the next level of things you might want. And then finally are the details, right? The actual internals, you know, what it specifically can and can't do, these kind of nuances. So I think most folks, when they kind of, you know, struggle to get motivation to write documentation. They're usually thinking of this third one, but like this third point, that's actually used by a minority of your users, right? There's a lot of people who'd be really happy if you got these first two points right. And so I would try really hard to get those first two points right. Number one, summarize what your project does. And number two, tell them how to use it, at least in the common case, right? Get those two points right. The third one's not saying it's not important. I'm just saying, don't let your reluctance to do the third one derail you from the first two, right? How hard is it to write two senses about what this project does, right? Um, et cetera. And so what's interesting about documentation is that for people who are developing a project, they're the ones sometimes who least appreciate it because they know how the code works. They know how to use it. So they don't see the, the value of it on a daily basis. And so when your project lacks documentation, you're actually hurting yourself by basically cutting yourself off from users and, cons and potential contributors for your project, right? Um, think about it, if you go around the web, number one, if you don't get the summarization right, what your code does, it's extremely unlikely someone's gonna find your project, right? And if they do come across it, they won't even realize what they found, right? So <laughs> make it clear what it does, that helps a lot, right? Great, but having additional documentation can really help your potential users and your users are more able to get into your project because our patients there to kind of welcome them. We're not only going to use it, which adds benefit, but also potentially even become contributors, right? So we want to help that out. So number one, you want to help, you said users and contributors, but also sometimes a good way to um, force you to think about uh, your uh, writing and what you're doing, right? Sometimes you may recognize that, fix type of white, still can see it. Um, Sometimes you may find trying to write something is hard to explain. And you keep thinking about why it's hard to explain a certain module, a certain function, and you realize, you know what, this is not a well thought out feature. And perhaps 
it'd be better to find that in a code review or initial design. But sometimes you find that when trying to write documentation, it may make you think, you know, I should change the interface around. You know, for, for example, if you're writing a library and your API is very hard to explain, perhaps you should rethink your API. And writing documentation for me kind of force you to think about what abstractions you're passing on to the users of the API and what do you expect them to know. When it comes to actually writing documentation, like I said, there's different levels, so don't always think about you know super big complicated things. Number one, you know, especially in this you know modern GitHub era, a README file is like the bare minimum. And honestly, a decent README goes a long way, right? Uh, and so for some projects, it's maybe the only thing you have, right? It's just a README file. And if you want to make this a markdown file, you get a little bit of prettier highlighting rather than just plain text. Sure, that's great. If you go back to the Chisel three, you can see that all this portion down here is their Read me, and they have quite a bit here. They have uh, the agenda for an upcoming conference. Actually, it just happened a while ago. They have links to documentation. Then they have example codes. Then they're getting started. It's quite a bit. This is a pretty long readme. It doesn't always need to be this complicated, right? But it's a bare minimum, right? The novel readme in the modern era is kind of insane. Um, but beyond that, you might want to actually have more proper documentation, right? So there's kind of two paths to go. One is to kind of write documentation in line with your code. So something like ScalaDoc is great, right? Where you can you know, directly annotate certain classes, objects, methods, and say, hey, here are the parameters, here are the things. And you know, of course, it looks like just like commented out code in the uh, actual source files. But when you run the ScalaDoc tool, it goes ahead and renders it into HTML. And the advantage of this, of course, is that the docs are mixing with the code. So it's easy to keep them in sync. So if we go ahead and skip to the end, maybe I'll go ahead and close some of these windows so that way it's a little faster to get around. Um, oops. Go the end over here first. Okay. For example, let's go look at the Scala doc for Arbiter, right? As well as the results. So for the Arbiter, there's our Arbiter file. You can see, okay, yeah, here's some comments. In text form, they look like reasonable comments, right? It doesn't look too crazy. But when this is all, you know, for example, even down here. But then when this is turned into a web page, right? This is a scale block I'm using all quarter, right? And so a lot of this is generated by reading the code, not even the comments. But you can see some of these things, someone took the time to, you know, actually write some examples or whatever, and this is, this is all rendered for you, right? So just writing a little bit of nice, um, well formatted scale doc inside the comments, you can just all rendering. And so here I'm showing, you know, as text versus rendered HTML. Some IDEs even will render these comments in line. So when you're actually scrolling through your file, it appears rendered already. For example, uh, IntelliJ will do that in some cases. So yeah, uh, ScalaDoc's one great way. Um, I think this is really good for annotating specific modules or functions or whatever. Other times you kind of want to explain a more general process, a more general, uh, you know, the concept, in which case maybe you want to make a web page, right? So maybe a nice way of doing that, you can look at the source and then the result for some of these other components. For example, this is a document describing channel data types. You can see it's written in Markdown. Uh, it actually has some code snippets in here. Okay, so here someone wrote this out. And then when it's passed through the static site generator, we get a much more pretty um, page to look at, right? And so, yeah. Uh, Here's yet another way to do documentation. You might consider this one for your project. Cool. So that was a couple different uh, documentation tools. And um, in terms of where to host it, like I said, for readmes, it's you know automatically rendered on GitHub.com. Easy. Uh, for something like ScalaDoc, or if you want to use the other kind of stuff, static site generators, you need somebody to host it. In the modern era, it's not too hard to find web space, but to once again simplifying things further, there's a popular site called Read the Docs, which perhaps you've read documentation for some other project. This is a site that not only hosts static documentation, they highly encourage a certain style that's you know arguably very readable. And so that's a good thing to kind of join if that makes sense to you. Cool. Questions or comments on documentation? Are there any products anybody wants to shout out that has especially good documentation? Or do you want to shame for especially bad documentation? OK, well, the reason I was asking that question is perhaps when you think about writing documentation, what makes documentation good or bad? 
Well, I hope to convince you in a prior slide. Number one, if you get summarize what your thing does in three, two or three sentences, that's the most important thing in my book. But beyond that, what can make it better? Um, once again, first bullet point, be sure to include a brief summary of the overall function and purpose, right? Folks get so involved in the weeds, zoom out, realize the person's not inside your head. Try to go more top down rather than bottom up in terms of what you're explaining. You know, very broad, very uh, high level and kind of get more detailed. A lot of times engineers will kind of give a complete brain dump starting from the details and just going in the linear stream. And that makes for very uh, hard to understand documentation sometimes, even though all technical content's in there. Um, there's some other, you know, writing uh, truisms I try to come up with. Uh, for example, when you're talking about documentation for a certain module, you talk about what its purpose is more so than how it's implemented. A lot of times you, the creator, think a lot about implementing it, but really what someone else cares about is the abstraction it provides and how they're supposed to use it, right? That's what matters more. So think about that. Okay, here's a module for this. Not how it works internally, because if your code is well-written, they shouldn't care how, it's well how it works internally, right? They care about what you're supposed to use it for. Um, and once again, kind of emphasize how they're supposed to use the thing, you know, interaction, as opposed to abstractions, right? A lot of times folks want you to understand like five abstractions before they start telling you how to do things. And it's like, I, I would rather not. I'd rather just use your thing, right? And so um, think about, you know, what's the fewest number of concepts you need to teach them before they start using your code and how to kind of get off and running right away. And if you, if you need to understand a lot of things before that, like I said, once again, this may be an opportunity to kind of reflect on your project and realize I have all these different abstractions and classes. Perhaps I can streamline some, you know, make some classes that cover the common case and they can have fewer things they need to learn. And yeah, as I said, right, is anything hard to explain? That's, that's something that maybe is worth reconsidering. Cool. Okay, so then in the remaining segment. I'm going to talk about open sourcing. I'll pause for any questions and comments so far. Okay, so uh, open sourcing. Uh, well, I'm going to try my best to both introduce you to open source as well as uh, make the pitch for why you should open source things. Um, as a reminder, for your course projects, they're actually not required to be open source, right? I'm not requiring that of you. So far, most students seem to open source them. And it's been nice. Perhaps you've looked at prior quarter's products and gotten some insight or inspiration. So it's good to keep doing it. Uh, but let's talk about why we're doing this, right? Well, number one, most of you are grad students. And so, uh, you know, as researchers, our, our goal is trying to help, right? And so uh, research isn't so helpful if no one else can see it, right? You want to get your ideas out there, right? Um, sometimes folks are very worried about, you know, oh my gosh, if I want to my code, someone else you know, might use it and do other things. It's like, yes, that's what you want. You want them to use it, right? <laughs> like, heaven forbid someone t likes your ideas, right? And it's one thing to share your ideas, but actually sharing your code is a much more concrete way to get your ideas out there. So yeah, you do want people to use it, right? And so uh, you can really help others with this thing. And sometimes you might think, oh, I'm, you know, I like the idea of open source, but here I'm working in a corporate job and, you know, they're not gonna be wanting to pay me to give stuff away to the world. Well, maybe they will. Uh, if the code you're doing is not a competitive advantage for your company, some companies are actually very okay releasing it. For example, Facebook, or I should say now Meta, realized years ago their competitive advantage is the data, right? The graph, the user graph, right? And so there's a lot of things they've open sourced because they found that, you know what, if we open source this, not only like the better for the world, but people can take our open source code and they can improve it, right? And oh wait, that makes life better for them. So by open sourcing it, they're actually getting their own code improved by others. And yet they aren't losing any competitive advantage because they haven't given away their competitive data, right? And so in this modern era where a lot of times data is king and not so much the code, uh, yeah, it's good open source things, right? Uh, and so it turns out when you release things to the community, they can often find bugs, they can make it go faster, et cetera. Uh, a lot of things are really improved by open source contributions. Um, as individuals, having a good open source record can really help raise your profile. Uh, this is perhaps most pressing for undergrads who really were looking at that first internship yeah, I think if you have, you know, a number of significant open source contributions as opposed to a GitHub repo, which is just one class project, it looks very different to a recruiter, right? <laughs> so yeah, definitely a great way to get noticed, get exposed, et cetera. Um, if you make something especially popular, yeah, a lot of people that actually do coding appreciate that and they, they respect that. That's a good way to kind of get some respect and some notoriety. In addition to all these positive things, you know, number one, help the world. Actually, other people can help your code by releasing it. It can help give you fame. Uh, at the end of the day, my answer is kind of more, why not, right? Um, 
In this course, for example, we benefit a lot from open source code. Even if it's not in this course, you benefit a lot from open source code, for example, even things like Linux or whatever. And so someone else was this generous, continue the generosity, uh, why not? And to that same extent, kind of what's the harm, right? Sometimes folks worry, oh my gosh, I might, you know, harm a business or something. Think about that carefully, but you may be okay, right? Um, if you're not going to infringe on a certain patent or business model, um, why not release it? It's better to kind of put it out there. It's kind of easier to default. Uh, even for things just locally, pragmatically, right? If you have a public repo, it's easier to clone it, right? Rather than having like, you know, log into an account and download a private repo or something, right? So if you can, just put it out there. I don't know, does anyone have any other reasons why they would maybe perhaps like open source or perhaps they'd be afraid of open source they want to share? Okay, well, we can keep going. <laughs> All right, so um, what I think, this is my own personal opinion, what makes a successful open source project? Um, number one, needs to do something useful. <laughs> uh, number two, needs to work correctly. So in order to work correctly, not only needs to be correct, needs to have testing, convince others is correct and get there. It needs to be documented. People need to know about it and needs to be available with open source license. And so uh, you can basically do all of these things, right? So now in my experience, there's not been too many products I'm familiar with that did all five of these things and were like completely unused, right? Usually things that are released but unused mess up on one of these important things, right? Uh, sometimes things are very esoteric, right? So maybe it's not very useful. That's a really big problem. Number two, maybe it's correct, maybe it's not correct. But either way, the tests are not visible. So people don't know to trust it. Or maybe it actually does something useful. It actually is correct. But the owner didn't feel like documenting it. Folks still may not trust it, right? And then finally, maybe it does the first three things right, but it's kind of like a well-kept secret. Now, you might need a little, a little publicity, right? Get on Twitter, get on LinkedIn, get on social media, tell some folks about it to get it out there. Um, that's the advantage of a site like GitHub as opposed to hosting this on some random other site is that way is that community effect people will find it. Um, and if you look at something that's really famous, for example, someone like, you know, Linux, or maybe perhaps the most famous open source project after, you know, BSD Unix, um, what does it do? Well, it's an OS. That's something that's pretty useful. Uh, it's mostly correct. Of course, they're still testing it. It is documented. It's well publicized and has open source license. And so these are things that I would consider if you're trying to make an open source project to try and make it some impact. Make sure you're, you're handling all these issues. And if some of these issues you're not handling, you can go ahead and attack them, right? None of these are impossible, right? You know, um, make sure it's correct. Make sure it's documented, et cetera. If you don't have number one, if it's not doing something useful, then we don't have this conversation. That's something you have to have, you know, fixed from the beginning. And so in the remainder, I want to kind of talk more about number five, which is this issue of licensing. Okay. So what's interesting, this is maybe a very brief uh, comment on licensing and uh, the associated uh, consequences of that. But of course, please consult a lawyer for anything super serious. Um, okay, so when you create something, really anything. I mean, this could say novel as in it's new. It could be code, it could be text. Uh, believe it or not, you get a copyright to it, right? That is your thing. You've created that, uh, that is yours. And so what's surprising is some folks are saying, oh, you know, I, I, I released this, but I don't want to put this online because I don't want to like, you know, take it. And like, they can take it, but technically it is copyrighted, right? Um, even if you post it publicly online, right? Now, there's a caveat here, which I put on the slides, which is in many cases, if you create something in the scope of your employment, meaning, you know, using resources, time from an employer, you often, when you took the employment, signed paperwork, which you signed away attribution to your employer, or at least co-attribution to your employer. And uh, guess what? Here in this room, if you were paid for by a GSR at some point, you had to sign a form that signed University of California IP rights to what you work on. So it's not totally true. It's 100% yours anymore if you're working on university equipment or university time. But uh, in the general case, yeah, if it's something on your own equipment, on your own time, it is yours. Um, you put it online, it's still yours. And so actually, what's interesting is someone goes and downloads that, they can look at it, but they actually can't do much with it because technically, you know, almost anything they want to do with it would be copyright infringement. And so actually, in order for people to use your stuff, in addition to posting online, you need to give them a license. And the license grants them permission to do certain things with it. 
And it's, you know, certain things under certain conditions, there's different licenses with different, you know, permissions and restrictions, right? And so in other words, when you release open source software, you need to include license. Not just, oh, you should have that. No. Otherwise, you haven't really released it, right? Otherwise, it's just copyrighted code on the web they can look at, but because it's copyrighted, they're kind of really constrained in what they can do. The license instead specifies and clarifies what they can do, right? It's a really important step. Okay, so uh, what does this license actually say? Uh, for the vast majority of projects, or right, basically almost all projects, you're not gonna write your own license. There's a handful of standard ones, and you go ahead and pick one that makes the most sense for what features you care about, and you're gonna go ahead and grab that one, right? And so, looking at these licenses, what sorts of you know, features or details do they have? Well, for example, most licenses allow people to use code. That's the most important thing, right? Without that, they can't use your code. They often allow you to modify the code, which is sometimes you'd be explicitly granted that ability, but there's some caveats, right? Uh, for example, even though you're allowed to use this code, are you allowed to use it for commercial purposes? Many licenses say yes. Some say no, I want this to be a free, you know, academic thing. Or another thing, for example, if you change the code, are you allowed to keep those changes to yourself? Or are you required to distribute those changes? Some licenses require you, if you take our code and you modify our code, and you use the modified code somehow, you need to also release those modifications to the public. As you may hear, just referred to as you know, copy left versus permissive in terms of when this comes up in a bigger project, how do these kind of things interact? Addition to these very licenses, you may also wonder what can they do with regards to trademarks? Sometimes people will be very impressed by the institution that creates something and they attempt to use uh, you know, that institutional affiliation or a certain brand to thus you know, reflect well on their project. And usually licenses don't allow that, right? Just because you're using their code, you're just using their code. Doesn't mean you're affiliated with that institution. Doesn't mean you can use their brand to better your brand. And so this often is clarified in license files, <laughs> license contracts. And then the most subtle one, which comes up a lot recently, is okay, someone's given you permission to use the code, you've navigated the various intricacies about modifications, commercial, non-commercial, and so you've talked mostly about copyright and licensing, and then all of a sudden, wham, patents. Uh, so <laughs> it turns out, of course, you know, patents and code are, are different, right? So code is you know, more like text for a novel or something like that. It's actually you know, a specific uh, artifact, and you can copyright that exact artifact versus a patent is you know, a patent a process or a technique, right? And so um, once someone's uh, patented something, right, you have to be very careful when you approach that functionality because you could perhaps be infringing upon their patent. And so when it comes to code, uh, code often you know, internally has certain processes. Those processes may uh, match what's been granted as a patent, right? And so there have been situations in which code has been open sourced, but people have been hesitant to use it for fear that they might be sued for using a patent that the code implements. And so thus to uh, assuage such concerns, some licenses such as uh, Apache V2, in addition to giving people permission to use the code, they also give what's called a patent grant, meaning you're allowed to use the patents included in this uh, code that the organization also has insofar as use the code under certain restrictions, right? You can't just, you know, use this code, claim it's in your repository, and use a patent whenever you want, however you want. No, 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 you have to use, you know, the implementation of that patent that way. But this is an important detail. And so, you know, when it comes down to specific licenses, you may hear things like GPL versus BSD, these are very common ones. Uh, this patent grant one is one that's kind of come up a lot recently about some companies are afraid to use things that are otherwise should seem very company friendly, but a patent grant can make them a little bit nervous. Or you say the lack of a patent grant. So when it comes to what licenses that are out there, um, you, here's just a handful of some of the most famous ones, but this is by no means an exhaustive list. There's plenty of places to go on the web if you want to find out more. So these are very vanilla academic licenses. Your BSD and your MIT licenses, they're similar but not quite the same. They're commonly used, especially for academic projects. Uh, you know, for many of the projects in my group, we tend to reflexively just use BSD. And so what does it do? Well, it's pretty permissive. Uh, and it works well for academic, industrial, and personal users, right? So it's, it's good in many ways. 
for the most part, people can you know go ahead and use your code. They can use their commercial purposes. They are not required to distribute changes, and people are pretty happy about all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's some shortcomings, right? Uh, now perhaps maybe you make this code and you're really committed to open source and you are sad about the idea of somebody using your code just modified without sharing those changes, right? So perhaps in that case, you should consider something called GPL, specifically version three, which had a very big change in its semantics. Um, and so, yeah, in this case, it does have restrictions about requirements to distribute uh, changes. And um, uh, what they call copy left, meaning, you know, it's inclusion incorporates some of these obligations, right? So as a result, uh, GPL v3 is sometimes banned in a lot of companies. If you, not just you can't release code of GPL v3, but you can't incorporate GPL v3 code because if you incorporate GPL v3 code because the copy left under certain circumstances, you would be forced to release more than you intended. Uh, and so for this reason, this is kind of maybe the most aggressive, I would say, open source license. And so some uh, products use this, but this is, I guess, perhaps less popular because of its aggressiveness, unless you're a really hardcore open source zealot. A dead end spectrum is the Apache one. Uh, it's very much like the BSMIT, but said this, the key benefit, it has this patent grant, meaning if you have an Apache v2 license, you can not only use the code someone gave you, but you're allowed to use any patents it inadvertently contains within that that original grantor includes, right? So in this case, someone like University of California, who's <coughs> a very large IP holder, this is convenient, right? Because that way, um, if you inadvertently were an encroach on a patent that perhaps you or even someone else from the giant UC system created, you can reduce their risk. So a lot of companies really like this. This is probably, I guess, perhaps the most desirable by companies <coughs> because there's what they call reduced risk. In this case, the risk they're referring to is the risk of a lawsuit. And this is because it's about as low, as they, low, a low of a risk as they can get. And then additionally, uh, you may be wondering, okay, well, what if I really, 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 really don't want restrictions on my code and uh, let people just use it? Well, there's some licenses for that as well. So something like, sometimes they call the unlicensed is one of them. <coughs> or excuse me, or another one you can spell out with the uh, initials, uh, you know, the do uh, WTF permissive license, you know? <laughs> and so generally you can tell that they're doing everything they can to give it away. Cool. Questions? Comments? Yes? Oh, so the question is, which of these is implied? None of these is implied. So like, if you just put code in the web, it's copyrighted but not released. You have to give it a license to be explicitly uh, available to others. So you get to choose. Uh, these are some of the most famous ones. I chose, I guess, what is this? Five of them, six of them? There's dozens, right? These are maybe some of the four or five most popular ones. Um, in terms of what's used commonly in academia, I would say most academics tend to use BSD, MIT, now sometimes Apache V2, GPL V3, uh, depending on the research group. Sometimes a lot of groups love it. A lot of other groups are hesitant to use it because the v GPL is sometimes completely unattracted industry, right? They're afraid to touch anything GPL. And so if you're releasing code as a researcher, you want others to adopt it, you might steer clear of that, but you also may be really hardcore about open source. And you want to believe everything needs to be open all the time, in which case you very much like the copy left and you want everyone to kind of be on board with that. But yeah, so academia, I would say it's up to the person. Uh, I've never come across a situation where you're required to release it with a certain license. They usually say, even for the open source hardware conference, for example, they'll say, as long as open source, that's good enough for them, and then you can choose license you want. Good question. Um, yeah, so those are some common ones. Uh, when it comes to license, when actually going about doing it, number one, you gotta pick one, and you gotta go ahead and include the license. So number one, make it prominent so folks can easily find it and recognize it. Uh, so a common practice is to have a license file within the root directory of your project. So for example, going back to Chisel, yeah, here it is. There is the license file. And because this license, um, we still have five minutes. Uh, because this license uh, is in GitHub, they're able to um, 
recognize this is a common license they've seen before and say recognize, oh yeah, by the way, even though this is you know the text file you have here, it's you know Apache V2. And so GitHub even has integrated if any kind of tells you what you can do uh, and what it does not provide. So for example, even though you're using this code, it's kind of going to use its own risk. They're not giving you any kind of warranty that's going to work or anything, or any liability for anything that goes wrong if you use this. You can't use their trademarks, <laughs> but you do get patents. That's a big deal. Um, okay, so then this works great for a lot of products in isolation. You can go ahead and you know drop a license file into your project, put it on the web. Things like GitHub can scrape it and find it. However, uh, we're starting a large project, and a large project includes a lot of other projects, and those other projects in turn include a lot of other projects. You then uh, have a concern about um, recognizing uh, which uh, licenses are included. And so, for example, let's say you're very concerned about if you include a project which includes a copyleft license, you want to know that, right? And so, there's actually tools that are made to go ahead and try and crawl code bases to identify which licenses are included within. And to ease that process, there is this SPDX format, which goes ahead and adds headers to files to make this easier. So we go back to our arbiter. We can see that, you know, for example, here is the SPDX license identifier telling people, oh yeah, if you come across this file isolation, this was Apache V2. Um, cool. And so, Let's say you go ahead and made a license, which is great. Folks can use it. And now you want people to actually contribute to your project. Here's some of my own personal advice for how to kind of make this uh, likely to attract contributions. It's not just you releasing things actually in the community started. Um, number one, you do something useful and interesting. That's kind of most important. Otherwise, why are folks going to do it? But how do you make this easier? Number one, testing, right? Testing lets them know when they make their own changes, they didn't break things. Testing lets them know that you care about things working, it's really, really important to get contributions to have testing. If you don't have testing, it's very hard to get contributions, as I say. Um, documentation, we talked a lot about that. That, of course, also helps. But here's one of these more surprising to some folks. You need to be responsive, right? If someone goes ahead and posts an issue or a pull request on your GitHub and leave it open for you know weeks or months, that suggests you don't care about what they're doing, right? So if you can go ahead and respond to those within a matter of days, that shows you care about their thing, and that, of course, leads to a positive feedback loop. So if someone comes to repo and finds, you know, a dozen months old issues without any responses, that's not very encouraging. They come there and they find, oh, wait, there's been, you know, 500 resolved pull requests. That's a good sign, right? Additionally, you can try and build communities with either mailing lists, Gitter as a service to have a chat associated with Git repo, even make your own stack overflow tag, et cetera. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting some of my colleagues have done, they've also done a little bit of checking these helped, Include a file that lists things you want contributions for. There's things you've identified, you know what, this would be helpful. You're not going to work on this immediately. If your project is out there, sometimes folks see that and like, you know what, I could do that. I want to do that. And they actually do do that, right? And so we've had, at least as academics, we've had cases of people doing that as a way to try and get themselves noticed for grad school admissions or just interested in collaborating. And so I've had, you know, one case in my graph research, I had a suggested contribution and someone did it. And they got a really great paper out of it. And I eventually uploaded it back, the code of my paper repo. And I'm like, that was cool. So yeah, no reason to kind of hoard ideas, right? Don't feel free to kind of get them out there and share them and kind of get communities going. Um, so hopefully today I've given you a lightning tour of a bunch of things involved with this project development. Like I said, I rearranged the lecture order to try and bring this earlier. So that way you have a chance to incorporate this in the last, you know, 10 days of your project. So hopefully some of you might consider trying out CI. Kind of cool setup. It's not too bad. If you want to you go ahead and set up a, work, a GitHub workflow, for example. Maybe try at least one code review with your partner or someone else. Really good way to learn how to improve. Try documenting some stuff. And please, 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 at a minimum, if you document, or not if you document, at a minimum, have a readme that explains and summarizes what your project does. That's like a bare minimum. Please at least have that. Um, and then, of course, very much optional, but hopefully I've convinced you why you should release your project as open source. And then I think the last slide is the thing I was using for links. Great. Cool. Any last questions? Okay, well, that's it. I did want to talk logistics first.